somebody else, look at somebody else just with all, just that just vociferous you can be, and look them in the face and say, you so crazy. It is extraordinarily difficult to approach anything in kings that relates to the northern kingdom. And just to bring you to speed, uh, when Solomon died, the kingdom was divided into two. You will notice that the southern kingdom was Judah and Benjamin. And they followed the king called Rehoboam. The northern kingdom, which is, consists of the other ten tribes, they followed a man called Jeroboam. It is interesting, very significant, because the northern kingdom then went their way under Jeroboam's leadership. And the southern kingdom, of course, stayed within the practices of the... Torah and the Pentateuch and they followed Rehoboam. It is interesting, very interesting, because when you deal with the Jewish people today, you are not dealing with the northern ten tribes. You are only dealing with two tribes because only two tribes were left. And there are only 14 million Jews in the whole world and I think oftentimes we as Christians misapply the scriptures and we take what's exclusively theirs and make it Christian. <laughs> uh, thou shall be the head and not the tail. And we enjoy that in a Christian arena, but if we take the right slice of the pie, then we should know where to put it. I'll give you an example. If uh, we say that the wealth of the wicked is saved up for the righteous. And, oh, oh, I feel that one. We go to go to dancing on that one really well. And, uh, and, and you consider then, we consider in the hour in which we live, could it be talking to Christians or is it talking to the Jewish nation? That's why I'm working with it. Uh, the greatest transfer of wealth happens to go from Christian America to Islamic countries to the tune of $900 million plus a year. So Christian America is exporting $900 million plus, maybe over a billion now, for the fuel we burn to Islamic countries. I just have a feeling that we are financing our own demise. Or the second thing is that Christian America owes the Confucius, the Buddhists, mm -hmm, and the Hindus somewhere close to six trillion dollars. I think I read somewhere else where the borrower was servant to the lend. So now I'm trying to figure out why we are struggling to find jobs and while everything has shifted to uh, outsourcing, I'm trying to figure out who is the righteous and who is the wicked. Uh, you see, I said all that to say that in preaching and in teaching, we have to be very careful that we don't misapply the scriptures. What belongs to one doesn't necessarily belong to the other. And it's quite significant because the greatest problem we will ever have in the house of God is not sin. The greatest problem we will ever have is false teaching. Oh, I feel something happening. Uh, now, there is no way then to approach this text and deal with the northern kingdom as we're dealing with in Samaria without understanding the meaning of the term, the sin of Jeroboam. And we have to put it into perspective with another text in First Kings, and this one also, where it says there's 7,000 that has not bowed to Baal. 
This is spoken now of the Northern Kingdom because the historian says that too much is said about the sin of Jeroboam for us not to ask what is that sin? What is it that Jeroboam did that completely annihilated the whole ten tribes of Israel? And I want to be very sure that whatever that is, I don't have it anywhere close to me. It is mentioned more than 20 times, and uh, it sort of have hypnotized the brain of at least 15 kings of the Northern Kingdom. Its destructive influence continued over a span of 250 years. In fact, it was the prime cause for the writing of Second Kings 15, and here's what it said. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord... God cast them out of his sight, as he said by all his servants, the prophets, unquote. The captivity then, which he speaks of here, these ten tribes never got back. And we have to know what it is. Now, now I first thought that it was rebellion. I thought it was the sin of rebellion in that Jeroboam separated the ten tribes from Rehoboam. And if that is so, then it could only happen one time. Because it's only in the breaking of the one time that that sin could be precipitated, that revolt. Which means that every other king who followed the tutelage and leadership of Jeroboam would not have had an opportunity to revolt against Rehoboam because they would have come under the revolt of Jeroboam. So it could not have been the sin of rebellion. Then I said, well, if it's not that, then it could be idolatry. But then I found out that Solomon had more idolatrous relationships because of all of the multiplicity and plethora of women that he married. Ah, uh, you know, that's quite a thing here to have uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines and not be pulled into their worship. If you notice there, idolatry was all over Solomon's reign. And uh, you need Nehemiah to talk about Solomon's reign when he talks about uh, how the women drew Solomon away from operating within the parameters of the Torah. So whereas Jeroboam never went after Baal or Ashtaroth, he never went after Milcom. And so notice even when they brought the calves, they were simply trying to go to a more primitive type of worship. So the sin of Rehoboam is not and cannot be idolatry. In fact, Judah, the two uh, tribes were more guilty of idolatry than the northern kingdom. One writer puts it this way, of the kings of Israel, only Ahab and his two sons were guilty of idolatry. Whereas of the kings of Judah, only five resisted the temptation. So notice then, it can't be that, because the non-idolatrous kings of Israel are charged with this sin when the idolatrous kings of Judah are not. Uh, don't get nervous, you know, I can hoop any time, you know, I can mm, do that any time. And that's not anointing, that's just me. Uh, the truth is now then, then what is it? What is it? What is it? I think the equilibrium is established, is uh, already uh, destroyed. <laughs> the sin is the sin of heresy. And as I point out to you, that the very worst thing that can happen within the parameters of any church is false doctrine. 
You don't have to tell me what lying is, and you don't have to tell me what stealing is. You don't have to tell me what fornication is, and you don't have to tell me what adultery is. We know that. That's right out in the open. But when you teach me a word that is not founded totally upon the word of God, then you defeat me from the very beginning of my walk with God. Because if faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, if it's not the word of God, then it cannot build my faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Oh, I feel something happening. Uh, you see, more than anything then, the word heresy simply means selection of doctrines. And it's a selection or choosing instead of dutifully accepting those things which God ordained. Uh, Jeremiah just chose his practices, Jeroboam rather, chose his practices says over God. I have listened for 25 years to a certain type of health, wealth, and prosperity preaching. And I believe to a great extent we have substituted the objectivity of the Word of God for subjective declarations as a prophetic word from God. I wish somebody to help me. Uh, somebody should have told us that we shouldn't have bought those houses. Somebody should have told us we should have slowed down and kept some cash in reserve. Somebody should have told us that we should not have gotten that far out with our financial differences, simply believing that ontologically or mystically God was going to pay for it. Somebody should have told us that God does not glitch computers in the night and you are debt free in the morning. Uh, I wish I had some help here tonight. Uh, I know it's heavy, but uh, you know, we're going deeper before we go higher. We're just climbing up. Uh, because it became extraordinarily subjective. I don't decide what I want to tell you you and then go to the Bible and make it say what I want. I need to go to the Word of God and let the Word of God prescribe to me what God would have me to do. Because when I play with His Word, I play with the foundation on which I stand. And when I become heretical, then it destroys the continuity of the power that that God has in his word. Can I take it further? He chose not only his subjective doctrines, but he chose his own place of worship. God had ordained that they should be only one sanctuary. And it's happening today where we decide who we want to hear when we sit in front of a television. And we decide to be TV members and, and fail to understand the need to be in the sanctuary. Uh, there is an anointing in the sanctuary where the name of God is placed that you're not going to get sitting in front of a TV eating eggs and pancakes. Uh, with somebody here. Uh, uh, every now and then you've got to come and sit in the house where your anointing can rub against my anointing, where your strength becomes my strength, and my strength becomes your strength, and my unique view of God is now shared with your unique view of God, so that all of us together can listen to one voice that God ordained, and speak to every single need that's in the house of God. Oh, I feel something happening already. You see, what he did was he divided and, and moved them out. And now I feel it here. The tribe was Judah and the place was Mount Zion. It wasn't Ephraim. God chose Jerusalem and declared that is where the sanctuary ought to be built. There's an anointing.